was the habitual association of ideas by resemblance, by spatial contiguity. You know, your eyes are typically all the way, or the eyes of faces that I see are typically under the eyebrows, which are typically under the forehead, which are typically over the nose and the mouth. And those contiguity relationships in most regular families, I mean, we, we leave Newton families aside for a second, are constant. And so the baby learns how to recognize faces by associating certain contiguity relations, certain patterns of contiguity. And finally, for him, the third form of association was that of cause and effect. As it is, even though it was the 18th century, he got causality wrong, but nevertheless, it is another association. Every time I kick a ball, the ball moves. Every time I light up a, a, a match and put it next to a piece of paper, the paper burns. There are regularities, causal regularities in experience that are associations, and that also allows me to give coherence to my experience. Today, with neural nets, we have created a technological instantiation of humans mechanisms. Because we did not have a technological instantiation of human mechanisms. Because computers from the 1940s to the 1990s were mostly symbolic and, 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 and based on programming and on logic and so on and representations, we thought, well, you know, this just gave a further boost to the neo-Kantian paradigm. With, with exception of people like Dreyfus, with exception of people that were critics of the symbolic paradigm. But you can criticize something to death, and if you don't put something instead, some concrete paradigm, some actual neural net that you can train to recognize faces, that you can train to recognize colors, that you can train to recognize how to walk around the room, you're not going to get the, the, the solidity of certainty, or at least the, the, the solidity that there's something true, something real. So to conclude, today we are in a very different position than we were at the beginning of the 20th century. Beginning of the 20th century, Saussure and other linguists had, for the first time, discovered the secrets of language between Saussure and Chomsky, who worked in the 1940s and 1950s. Linguistics went from one success to another success to another success. And, the, and, and that just strengthened the thesis of the linguisticality of experience. Then came computers, and computers were also based on language and logic. One decade, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and that continue to strengthen the thesis of the linguisticality of experience. But today, both on a philosophical realm and to materialist philosophers like Gilles Deleuze, who have recovered that aspect of Hume, which is not the, 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 the obsolete foundational epistemology, and thanks to connectionism, which is exploding on the scene, and it has ever more elaborate examples of have neural nets without representations in a purely dynamical way and managing only patterns, patterns of sensation linked with motor patterns, which is what you, what you get when you learn how to ride a bicycle. You learn how to associate certain visual and perhaps audio patterns with certain motor patterns. Today we have an ever-growing body of technology that's operating on a human basis. So we don't have to defend Hume anymore on a purely abstract plane. Yes, we do have to start removing conceptual confusions like knowing that and knowing how, like signification and significance. So there's plenty of work for conceptual work, but technology has, has now added momentum to this new search for a new theory of experience. It's strengthening the search and it promises to perhaps make the 21st century the century of <coughs> non-linguistic practices, the century of bodily practices, the century of, of a materialist conception of experience, which cannot be anything but good for artists, because artists are ultimately engaged with an interplay, a dramatic interaction between their bodies and their minds and these raw colors in a canvas, the raw sounds in a song, the raw aromas in an installation piece, the raw heat and pressure of different it, it, it works of art. And it is, it is important for them to be able to start confronting these sensations and these feelings again in their raw intensity without the mediation of language. Thank you very much. I'd love to visit you in Mexico to do some drugs, but I bet you. <laughs>
Für mich ist es genau so bad, dass wir eine Art zu kriegen, die mit den Praktikern und den Polizisten, die wir mit 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 den Polizisten, First time when you came in here and made this argument between the realists and the idealists, if you remember, I came to you on that point. Yeah. Really? Yes, and I said, come on, is this to do? It's not necessary to pick up the straw man in order to make your own sides uh, so strong. Because there is, in every realist, there is an idealist, and every idealist, there is a realist. It's more a question of emphasis, and emphasis doesn't really, it's not merely emphasis. Totally on the right with you, it has strong consequences where your emphasis lies. So I'm very happy that you remember uh, Gadamer's uh, story when people come to him and uh, say, you know, it's not all linguistic, it's not all language. It's seeing that can be understood as language, it's in that the conversation, everything we have. And then he said, yes, but you are talking about it. So that's a prima facie thing to be, be talking about. But on the other hand, we all know that talking about it does not make it so. So we have to have experience, practices, interventions, uh, certainly. But you see, today I listened to you and I could agree, I could agree more, but I would call it phenomenology, <laughs> radical phenomenology. And that's not the whole of phenomenology, certainly, but this is Merleau-Ponty, uh, much easier. So there had been a lot because the idea of Phenomenology was listen to the phenomenon and not to the single phenomenon, to the context, the practice of it. And don't come with your biases and know already everything. So if you need a language, and we all need a language, that's the language you inspired by what you <coughs> experience. And that is the great strength of a phenomenologist to do that. And I agree with you somehow that the deconstructionist, there is much more to place it, because they don't believe that they never believed it's possible to get out of better physics. You can only play it. We both know it is possible to go out of better physics in terms of experience. And you start not uh, trusting your uh, stories about it, and your explanation, and your definitions. So now ask them to be updated with your experience. And I think there is, a, is certainly a way in which uh, Hume uh, gets now a totally different uh, interpretation. And Weber actually, uh, the German word is verstehen. And we had a long discussion with this Gadamer about verstehen, understanding, and erklären, explain. And there was a point to say that the, uh, the natural sciences, their job is uh, a clear and not understand. But that again was something people said, what you are talking about. And even it's true that the natural sciences through experimentation, the experiment of experience, they already set, have a setup, they control. And so you cannot really trust in terms of understanding what they are what, what their outcomes. On the other hand, does it mean you have no understanding only because you controlled what you are going to do? That cannot be true either. Yeah, no, that's positivism, right? That is, that is not materialism. Yes. I mean, I mean, that's why I break with positivism as much as with idealism, because positivism is not just like public relations. That's what scientists say when they don't want to do philosophy. If they are so lazy to do philosophy, they say, oh, we are just controlling and predicting, right? And you say, you're not controlling and predicting, you're actually explaining. And you're opening new realms of experience by inventing new instruments, new telescopes, new microscopes, radio telescopes, you know, uh, inventing new realms of experience.